Welcome, everyone. Looks like we have, I think, most people are settled. Um, welcome to the panel on artificial intelligence and the new geotechnological competition. It's uh, part of a project for peaceful uh, competition, Finnish Institute of International Affairs uh, conference on managing Sino-Western relations in the new geoeconomic world order. And it's arranged together with the Policy Institute King's College London. I'm Charlie Slonius Pasternak. I'm the lead researcher at the FIA Center on US Politics and Power. Um, related to today's topic, uh, I guess the, the closest I've gotten in terms of research is spending some time at CCW at Oxford, Changing Character War Program, looking at how the information age impacts information operations. And, and I have a past a long time ago in a technology research company. But I'm your moderator today. And as such, I have a few admin pieces. One, anyone still hasn't, uh, please close your microphones and enter all your questions into the chat. Um, finally, before I introduce the first speaker, um, what I'd ask is, yes, we're here to discuss the effects of technological decoupling and uh, how, it, how it impacts cooperation. Uh, whether or not decoupling is set to increase, decrease, et cetera. But I think it's also important um, that we see what could be done to kind of um, uh, prevent the deleterious effects of decoupling, um, or if we can do things to decrease decoupling in some ways, uh, make cooperation possible in, in some aspects. Now, first speaker to talk about today, and I guess I should point out to the ones that have not received our stream of messages today. Apologies for that. Um, but of course, apologies that uh, we're, uh, as it were, stuck with only two of our three speakers today. But hopefully that'll give us some more time to uh, really get into the topic. The first speaker today uh, will be Valtteri Vuorisalo. Um, he's a former FIA Institute colleague. Uh, he's also the professor of practice I have to read this, the National Security and Security Policy at Tumper University. Um, the re research fellow at King's College, um, as well as then being the advisor for something that most people in Finland probably don't even know, which is the Scientific Advisory Board for Defense in the Ministry of Defense. Um, and his PhD is from Tampere University. Uh, Valtteri, um, you take it away. I know you're gonna paint us a broad picture and then dive into the topic, so. Take it away. Thanks, Charlie, and, and thanks everyone. And, and great to see everybody online. Um, and and like Charlie said in the intro of myself, there's there's a lot of line items there. Uh, I, I myself forget half of them half of the time. But as, as an elevator speech introduction to myself, and, and uh, it, it, I, I like to say that I have two loves outside of my family, and, and those are ICT and power politics and and those two things determine what i basically do uh basically all the time it's it's the, the the first thing that i think about when i wake up and the last thing that i think about before before i go to sleep from a professional perspective so you'll see that um enthusiasm throughout this uh talk that i'm going to give you to you now for for approximately 20 minutes what i'm going to talk to you about especially is the importance of data and the grow, growing importance of data within the international system and what that means uh, for, well, uh, us as individuals, uh, small nation states, uh, great powers and, and, and the like. So if we kick off with, with the, and, and start to paint the uh, picture and, and, and I'll bring your imagination to uh, thinking about different types of flows and 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 transactions, the 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 basic arguments of and and, and starting points of of this speech is that our Western way of life is dependent on various types of transactions, and and these transactions can be, well, they can be uh, energy, uh, they can be traffic, uh, they can be pandemic, uh, human migration, but from my perspective, uh, and and you might recall my ambitions and 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 passions in life, what what 
is especially important to realize is that data and information flows play an increasing role in everything that we do, um, not only in our daily lives, but also within the international system. So what that means is that you can think of this as an evolution of geopolitical thinking. And, and, and when I say evolution, that is slightly incorrect because I'm not, I'm definitely not implying that uh, quote unquote old geopolitics is not important vice versa i'm saying that it's super important still um uh, and when with old geopolitics i mean map based territory based uh thinking and and the theories what i am saying is that on top of that we have a uh, system of capability that is based on uh, topology. It is based on different types of nodes and the interactions between these nodes, like I described earlier. And, and the interactions and transactions form uh, different types of flows. And technology plays a critical role in enabling these, naturally. And, and since our way of life is dependent on these, the technology becomes super important. So that's like a no-brainer. But um, the, the difficulty from a nation state perspective is what technologies actually are there and, and what is the impact of these technologies to our way of life. And, 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 and nation states typically have a hard time in, in following this progression of, of technology. Thus, it becomes important to realize uh, uh, what, what, what is out there and, and also to develop these technologies that have a role in our lives. The, the president of, of Finland has tweeted himself that, uh, and, and, and I think he says it nicely how, to, and, and, and to quote him, he says that uh, technology is now in, irreversibly intertwined with great power competition. And, and what I really like is that he goes on to say that it goes on to say that it is both the stage of the competition and it is also the prize at the same time and 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 there is a uh, ongoing race to whose technology and whose standards of technology become dominant in the world and and this notion of understanding standards is is very critical because like i said earlier nation states have a difficult time understanding what uh, technologies are out there, what are the impacts of that, what is the regulation cycle for these technologies. And since that takes time, the standards of those technologies form the de facto governance systems of that behavior that those technologies enable. So it, that is a, a new form of power, if you will, within this system, and, and, and I've heard it say, and sometimes it's attributed to uh, uh, Chinese thinking, and, but I'm not sure, I, I don't have a source for this, but, but just to underline the importance of, 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 of standards, and, 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 and the thought goes that, that you know, it, if, if you're a grade three country, you build things, if you're a grade two country, you design things, but if you're a first grade country, you set the standards for things. So, it is quite important indeed. And uh, from a small state perspective, especially, you know, I'm a, I'm a Finn, so I constantly keep thinking about that. Um, uh, constantly keep thinking about how this impacts a small state. Um, it's important to realize that we have very little influence on what these technologies and, and standards actually are. And, 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 and we might argue that the European Union itself is is in a, in a in a disadvantage when we compare capabilities to the US and 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 China but the technology itself is only a tool and and it does not function without data and the ability to refine utilize data is increasingly correlating with the global distribution of power. And, and from an artificial intelligence perspective, what is, is the theme here today, uh, uh, at, uh, from, for at least from a, from a bit, or from one standpoint, um, artificial intelligence, of course, is developed with data. Without data, you don't have artificial intelligence. Um, without data, uh, the, the argument goes, you cannot, well, function. 
um, efficiently with the capabilities that that you already have. But that even that type of thinking, which some organizations have a hard time with, and, and let me reiterate because this is, this is important. And 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 for those of you who are familiar with the network centric warfare doctrines. The basic argument goes that if you have data at the right place at the right time, distributed in the right way, that will enhance this the capabilities that you're running, let's say a weapon system. But with the increasing role of data, that basic premise is turned upside down. And, and with a data centric mindset, what you start need to start thinking is, is how do you uh, actually use that, in this case, weapon system to both gather, impact, and protect the data stream, which becomes your primary and permanent asset for your mission. And your mission can be, well, basically whatever you want. And this re uh, permanent and, and, and primary asset quote is from the United States Defe Department of Defense uh, data strategy. So it's not just me and, and the president talking about the importance of these things. Uh, the United States and, mind you, the UK's integrated review uh, and, and, and associated military uh, policies correctly, in my mind, identify the role of data. Now, we could go on and on about how do you actually utilize data and what are the difficulties of utilizing data because, you know, all data is not equal. Um, uh, and and a common misconception is that you know well you know, we'll just use data and 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 we don't think about the fact that it actually requires a lot of work on uh, different data sets but different ontologies formats um, etc are, are are associated with 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 different data sets so that's it's, it takes a lot of uh, hard work to to get the data flow um, up and running but if we skip all that um what 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 is difficult for uh, our our thinking in 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 the modern world or not in the modern world but in our modern era is that we have this situation where the old and the new exist at the same time i, I mentioned like the old geopolitics and, new, and the new topology based thinking but as technology accelerates we also have different m mega themes or mega trends going on we have Convergence and divergence both accelerated by these dynamics. For example, we have the convergence of technological capabilities in our mobile phones. We have a divergence phenomena where our, our identities are, are diverged. The, the impact or the, the central control of financial institutions is, is, is diverged. Um, the military capabilities that are hardware based evolve slowly and, and the brains and, and the, the software that governs them evolves very quickly. This puts a new strain on security of supply plans and, 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 and thinking. So if, if, if we accept all of that and, 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 and try to summarize it, um, summarize the role of data, what you often hear is, is, is a saying that data is the new oil. And, and I have to admit that I really did not like, like that phrase uh, when I first heard it, but, I, but I've grown to like it quite a bit because it nicely underlines the strategic importance of data. When you compare it to oil politics in the world, for example, you start to get an idea of, of how, what level of strategic resource we're talking about. If, if you recall the, the, the violence and, 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 and the, the mobilizations and, and and power projection uh, campaigns that have been associated with with oil policy, uh, you can start to question or raise questions that will these be associated with data policies as well, and 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 if and if we start to think about oil, we're all taught at very at at very early age in our in our lives uh, who are the oil producing countries, and, and you know I can still probably get ninety percent right. Uh, uh, but the question is, who are the oil, who are the data producing countries? So if we know where 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 oil resides, where does data reside? Who has who has it? Um, is it is it who has the best quality of it? As you recall, oil is not the same if you drill it in you know let's say in Saudi Arabia versus Texas or Russia. It's not the same oil. 
what do you need to do with with different types of data in order to make it quote unquote run in your engine and and if it is a fuel for your action and a, and a critical resource and from a security supply perspective we uh, have these huge uh, storages of, of, of oil from a crisis scenario, what data do we actually need in a time of crisis? Do we know what data is critical for us to maintain our critical business processes, for example? How would we know those things? What is the life cycle of those things? We, we, when we start to raise these questions, we unfortunately very quickly start to understand that we don't know what the answer is to all of these things. But at the same time, we realize we, we are very dependent on these. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll throw a few analogies as well, uh, and w which I really like. Uh, and, and, and one is that, um, you know, if, if we have a data leak or sorry, an oil leak, it becomes, you know, toxic waste. What if we have a data leak? Um, if we have financial institutions that are too big to fail uh, and they need to be uh, supported in order to not create a shock in the system. Um, do we have companies who have so much data that they cannot be allowed to go bankrupt? Can they be sold? What do we do with data, even on, on a lower level, once it is uh, sold to uh, another party? So we have all these questions um, that exist at the same time when we have the physical reality that, that we live in. We need to start thinking about new modalities of, of being and, and, and thinking for what is valuable, for example. So to tell you a, a quick story, I brought, bought um, uh, uh, a device uh, that was really cheap and I realized that the reason why it was cheap is that that device integrated with my personal data. Okay, so fair enough. It was cheap from a euro perspective because I paid with my data. Now, did I make a good deal or not? Was that transaction expensive or cheap? I have no way of knowing, do I? I have no way of comparing if, if me buying this device who accesses my data this much, is that cheaper or more expensive than this device that costs 10 euros more but logs in into only so and so many of my digital identities. So we need new vocabularies and, and frameworks to start having this discussion. And, and, and I apologize, but I digress for one uh, minor example, which, and, and I'll use my mother uh, for, for this example, who's 75 and in a wheelchair in the later stages of her life. But if I ask her the question that mother, should we, uh, give Finland's sovereignty to the European Union on, let's say, the issue of cu cucumbers. Um, she'll have an opinion immediately. She'll have an understanding of what we, what it is that we're talking about, what is the impacts of it, what, it, what is the terminology associated with this discussion, and we can go on and to have that debate. But if I would ask her the question, Mother, should we uh, g you know, give Finland's data sovereignty over to you know, a public cloud, she wouldn't have any clue on how to have that conversation. And thus, we're at, at, at uh, the dawn of a new era uh, for, for uh, from that perspective. Uh, but if we, if we go back to do to the importance of, of data and, and the convergence dynamic uh, that, that, that we see, and the great power rivalries, uh, we can see from a data perspective, that data is gravitating towards U.S. and Chinese controlled hubs, um, and 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 the convergence of of this uh, data to these two hubs is is accelerating the divergence of states into haves and have-nots of data, and 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 let's use Finland as an example. We do not have data on that scale that we're talking about when we talk about the US and, and, and China. That has an impact to what we should be doing as a nation. Um, we, what is our policy towards data? And and and, and that is an interesting uh, uh, conversation to have. Maybe we'll, we'll start it off uh, today. So we're, we're, 
we have this new dynamic going on, a new form of great power competition where the stage, the world stage is, and the actors and, and the norms that govern the stage are all transforming at the same time. Um, it's not only, from an actor's perspective, it's not just nation state, not just great uh, powers. It's it's also the new, you know, the, the big tech companies. It is it is organized crime. Sometimes it's just a bored high school uh, kid who can cause uh, major disruptions within the international security architecture. But if if we look at uh, uh, China, China has uh, very uh, uh, is or China's role is increasing uh, from a systemic uh, perspective, and then the Western countries often accuse China uh, from from you know in, engaging in, in in behaviors of of data collection that that sometimes violates the Western's uh, nor norms. Um, and and um, but that is just uh, just just one uh, aspect of of the narrative. The 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 main narrative is is that. China has a huge ace up its sleeve, I would argue, which is the uh, well, not only just the size of the economy and and, and general trend that that is going on uh, from in 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 China, um, but but the masses of data that is it is able to collect from its population uh, without the hindrance of norms and legislation that we in the West. Are associated with, or and and so in essence, this gives China uh, within China. Let's let's first talk about that. A a, a data set where uh, human behavior is is collected uh, and and is source material for let's say artificial intelligence creation uh, from all brands of life, right? Um, like biological data, human patterns data, behavior data. And 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 you know this has gone on for for years and years and years. And you know this this type of data can be used to, you know, and, and very often we talk about security uh, solutions. Well obviously that's that's one thing. But but another important thing is the ability to create, for example, new business and 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 dominate the business domain from 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 this perspective it's it's really important to understand that we for example in the in the european european union a do not have a similar capability to collect and store data um and and even if we theoretically did we have legislation that prohibits the utilization of this data so there's a structural disadvantage if you will uh, on this and 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 to note and for the record i'm not arguing for you know the uh, our, our country to do a similar uh, data collection process i'm just you know observing what, what what's going on uh chinese uh, technology is of course uh, accused of 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 sending materials uh and when i say materials i mean data back to china uh, uh that is a concern raised by some countries and then we all know the huawei discussion um etc but um, I think the data set example is 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 quite uh, relevant and, and powerful, and I'm looking to forward to having more conversation today on this, because as a as European Union, as Finland, what is our policy towards this? What what I mean that that is such a huge advantage that they enjoy that how can we expect to uh, uh compete and and when we start thinking about competition and 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 setting up our capabilities let's go back to the argument that data is the new oil and a currency uh, uh for for wealth and power and and think about the european union for a second who is a regulatory power and and the argument goes that you know, the European Union can regulate access into the markets of 400 million people, a market of of 400 million who uses a currency, or you know, the euro, uh, quite or, or typically not not limited to. But if data is the new currency for power and wealth, would you, as an investor, invest in an area of 400 million that is highly regulated 
and 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 you can harvest quote unquote harvest that's a negative word but but for the lack of a better one i'll just use it uh data from four four hundred million uh or would you take your business elsewhere which is not as regulated and gain access to seven and a half billion it's a theoretical example but i'm but, but what i'm what i'm trying to um highlight and uh, is 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 the question that you know are we regulating ourselves to death on this topic and or, or oh oh sorry i didn't i was sorry charlie <laughs> thanks <laughs> like i said i've had too much coffee today so i'm uh, apologies if i'm rambling so i noted the two minutes so thank you i'll wrap this up um the, the point i was trying to make there earlier is that's that we we when when data gains importance within the international system, we 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 come across new questions, and and we need to figure out what our answers to these questions are, and 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 one question for the European Union is that is regulation the best policy in this new form of competition that is based on access to and the utilization of data, data which is the prime ingredient for artificial intelligence, for example data which is the prime ingredient for our financial flows and 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 new forms of interdependencies which our way of life is dependent on but and i'll close with this is also a new source of serendipity and a new source of surprise that is very at times very hard to to predict and i'll give you an example as i close we as humanity are in a new stage in existence where everything in theory and increasingly so is remembered. What does that mean? And, 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 and how we as rational risk IBERS players perhaps plan for a situation where in 15 years our data that we save today, like in this session, is still accessible and and the context of reality that we live in in 15 or 20 years might be so different that that might have a huge impact on our our realities so with that um i'll, I'll close and 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 thank you for 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 listening hope hopefully this this uh uh helps set the scene for for later today looking forward to the discussion Thank you very much, Valtteri. I have lots of questions. There's some questions in the Q&A, and even your last observation uh, uh, got me thinking. Uh, humans tend to be wired to continually retell our life stories even, and usually most people tend to tell more positive versions maybe. Um, so, uh, but on the other hand, I have to say I sometimes look back uh, as I'm moving at my old university papers and realize that there was at least one point in my life I actually knew how to write. So <laughs> that's, you know, a, a, a nice thing. Um, but uh, second speaker, um, Edward Hunter Christie, he's now a senior research fellow with us at FIA, which is brilliant. He's also a senior fellow at the pra pra Prague uh, Security Studies Institute. And uh, he was a NATO official from 2014 to 2020 focusing on many of the issues we're discussing today. And as I understand, he's going to give a rundown of kind of how to view um, even some concepts or theories and then look at U.S. policy responses to these questions. But without further ado, take it away. Thanks very much, Charlie. It's uh, it's a delight to be uh, able to speak at this event. So uh, I'll I'll dive right in. Maybe just a, a word of caution. I am a former NATO official and I'm going to have uh, present what I understand to be the US perspective, um, and I'm going to present perhaps a perspective which focuses more on the antagonistic aspects of the US-China technology competition with also some references to the military aspects of it. So my, my presentation is not designed to be a balanced overview picture presenting both the antagonistic side and the collaborative side. I'm going to focus on the antagonistic side. So just to just a forewarning. So my talk will have three main parts. Uh, I'll first give a short intro on what AI is and why it matters so much economically and militarily. 
Then in the second part, I want to do a bit of a detour through schools of thought in economic policy and how with the US-China technology race, we're also going through a sort of intellectual transformation about how to think about optimal policies in the context of a, of a technology race between great powers. And then from those considerations, I'll go through a list of US policy responses, things like export controls, investment screening, counter espionage, investment bans, uh, but also new ideas on uh, new US ideas on how to promote investment and have more dynamic ecosystems, especially at the intersection of civilian and military needs. So artificial intelligence, I'll give one definition, uh, which is uh, one that's used at NATO notably. Uh, it's the ability of machines to perform tasks that typically require human intelligence. For example, recognizing patterns, learning from experience, drawing conclusions, making predictions or taking action. Uh, and this can be digitally or it can be as the smart software behind autonomous physical systems. Artificial intelligence in its current wave and so there are different types of artificial intelligence, but the current wave is primarily centered on machine learning, including deep learning. And one way of understanding machine learning is that it's basically consists of automated statistical learning algorithms that are trained on large data sets such that they become very effective at correctly recognizing patterns and making predictions when they encounter uh, new uh, new data. And the data in question can be of any type. It can be numbers, text, audio, images, video. If it can be digitized, it can be used. Um, and of course, we heard uh, plenty in, in Valtteri's presentation earlier about the importance of data, so I'm not going to, to treat that subject. Um, but a general comment to understand why machine learning matters so much today. Uh, in, in essence, it's uh, because since a few years, machine learning algorithms or deep learning algorithms have started to outperform human beings on quite a broad range of pattern recognition and prediction tasks. There, there's some quite well known examples. I'm not going to talk about computer games or, or chess, although those examples are also valid. Um, but there are examples from, from uh, narrow uh, medical diagnostic tasks, for example. Uh, there's a there's a large number of examples that already exist. Some of them already achieved several years ago. So peering into the near future, if we have appropriate eyes and ears, so to speak, on robotic systems, by which I mean sensors, of course, we're looking at a world of intelligent connected devices, autonomous devices, capable of determining their own courses of action to solve particular objectives. This may occur with devices acting alone or in collaboration with other robotic systems or in human machine teams. And that may be in the cyber domain or it can be in physical domains uh, in the air, on land, at sea or in, in space. And so we're looking at uh, a fantastic ability to sort, to classify, to recognize patterns, to make predictions in both cyberspace and in physical spaces uh, over time, we'll be looking more and more at intelligent devices on factory floors, uh, but also on military battlefields. The range of potential military applications is just as vast as anything that requires human cognition. Analyzing and classifying visual data, organizing logistics, operating support vehicles, or uh, tracking and engaging hostile targets, if you imagine future autonomous weapon systems. So in short, AI is already doing many things and there is lots more to come. Um, but my focus is how to conceptualize that from a social science perspective. AI is what's called a general purpose technology and a definition of a general purpose technology is that it is a single generic technology which is recognizable as such over its lifetime that initially has much scope for improvement and eventually comes to be widely used to have many uses and to have many spillover effects. Just a few examples of previous general purpose technologies, the steam engine, railway transport, the internal combustion engine, electrification, the airplane, computing, and the internet. So, and this is really important for this discussion. AI is of course a dual use technology, but it is much broader than most dual use technologies. It, it is a general purpose technology. So to clarify that point, some examples of dual use technologies that are not general purpose, think for example of the jet engine, or for example of radar, or for example of laser technologies. These are all very important technologies with a fair range of military and civilian uses, 
but none of these examples are as transformative for the entire economy and for a wide scope of military, military activities in the way that a general purpose technology can be. So then the question is, well, what happens when you have a new general purpose technology? Many things happen. It's very transformational. It changes jobs. Some jobs disappear, new ones appear. It changes ways of working. And it does so in many different industries and many different areas of civilian life. It also transforms military operations. So there's a lot of adaptation and change involved. And all of those changes generate long lasting positive economic productivity effects and economic growth effects. But of course, also a lot of pressures for people in industries and states to adapt. It's nonetheless a relatively long process. A general purpose technology typically takes decades to fully mature and to fully unroll all of its effects across societies. But there are phases during which a lot of excitement is generated across countries and across borders. Think back to historical studies about electrification or the steam engine. Those were revolutionary moments. And there are, of course, multiple effects on public policies and also on foreign and security policies and defense policies. Political leaders understand that something important is, is happening when there is a, a new general purpose technology. And there is, of course, a transformation process in military affairs. Just think for one moment about the impact of the steam engine on military affairs or the impact of the internal combustion engine or the impact of electrification or the adoption of computing. If you think back to the 50s, 60s, 70s. So obviously at that point, great powers are going to start racing. Speed of technology adoption into the military sector becomes very important, and it's it's what we're seeing now. Switching to my second part, uh, so talking a little bit about aspects of economic thought. My main argument here is that the economic thinking and economic policy thinking that prevailed in the West roughly in the last four decades uh, has generally failed to account for some intuitively quite obvious problems relating to state power and to competition between states, while also not always giving a good account of the phenomenon of general purpose technologies. So starting from, from the beginning, the notion that a transaction is a win-win, that it's mutually beneficial, is absolutely central to how economic models are built. Theoretical models that account for coercion, uh, um, and examples could include models that account for criminal beh behavior or for slavery. Uh, those are very rarely studied. Economists, and I'm an economist by training, that, that's why I have, I want to give a little bit this angle in my presentation. Economists focus almost all of their time and energy on what economic agents do of their own free will. In that type of universe, uh, and again, this is in the world of economic modeling and, and, and uh, economic analysis, nations are effectively modeled as sets of economic agents that have transactions with each other. When you have a model with more than one country, the agents have transactions with agents in another country. In the simplest model to avoid uh, intractability, one simplifies all the agents of one country down to a representative agent, a kind of statistical average. Better models uh, to analyze trade issues take account of effects by sector. Typically, I mean institutional sectors. So the state versus the financial sector versus non-financial corporate sector versus households. And in those models, the state in one country will generally be assumed to be looking for an optimal policy. Um, and at this stage, many interesting research questions could be posed. But the most common choice is to assume that the state seeks to maximize the welfare of its own country uh, under equilibrium conditions. And that typically leads to conclusions about uh, the fact that lower import barriers are better than higher import barriers and, and uh, high import barriers are better than autarky. And that result is very strong, both theoretically and empirically. Models typically find that a small economy will find it best to have no trade barriers at all, whereas a large economy may find it preferable to have net positive barriers on average, but rather low. The next question concerns which sectors benefit from higher import competition. Uh, here, it's long been known by economists that less competitive industries, including their workers, will be losers from trade liberalization. On the other hand, liberalization is beneficial in the aggregate because consumers benefit from cheaper goods and services. What economists then recommend, uh, and it's what I kept on hearing in my early career, is that it's then up to the state to compensate the losers of globalization using proceeds from taxation. And then we still end up with a superior equilibrium as compared to a protectionist trade policy. All of these general findings, which I saw promoted by most economists throughout my early career, tend to skip over certain issues that have now become much more salient. 
The first is that there isn't always a clear understanding regarding the sources of long-term economic growth. In many economic models, technological change is assumed to occur randomly. There's a high degree of faith in the market being able to generate new technology. It's often assumed that if the state tries to pick winners, it will do a poor job, whereas the disciplining force of the market would be better. But that really is quite short-term thinking and applicable basically in a world of fixed technologies or in a world in which technological change really is exogenous and effectively random. The concept of general purpose technology, which is comparatively recent, has led to its own niche literature, which is multidisciplinary. Now with the rise of artificial intelligence, everybody has heard about the concept of general purpose technology. This wasn't always so. But now that everybody knows there's such a thing as general purpose technologies, everybody wants to know how they come about and how best to ride the wave, if you will, when they are here, also accounting for different stages of uh, technological maturity. The second issue is that there's not much understanding of exploitative strategies or antagonistic policies, if you like. For example, regarding the role of industrial espionage or more simply theft of intellectual property. Economists often don't like to model theft or espionage. The traditional stance, uh, the economic policy stance, is usually to call for every country to have secure, secure property rights. And then the idea is that once every country has sensible Western style institutions, uh, we should all rationally, uh, that everybody should rationally want. Uh, otherwise, within each country, there would be technology theft. Uh, then we can all trade together and we're back to a win-win and everybody benefits from, from trade. Um, but what has typically been assumed away is the possibility that an entire state would be deliberately pursuing a policy of economic espionage as part of a deliberate strategy. And that is what the United States is accusing China of doing. A third issue is that there was for a long time no explicit assumption about what might happen if China, at some point, reaching a very large GDP, what would we do if China decided to devote a relatively large share of its GDP to military spending, let alone to technologically advanced military equipment? So um, if the starting point, again, implicit, is the peace dividend of the 1990s and everybody's talking about win-win cooperation and market competition, then why worry about future military power? Of course, some people did. Um, but in the typical Western Europe context that where I had my early career, those voices were barely audible. In Washington DC in recent years, it's a completely different story. The point is that on balance, the economics literature has long had a bias against state intervention. For example, the debate about picking winners. If one goes back into economic literature from the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, something quite curious is apparent. This is anecdotal on my part, but by and large, empirical studies that find that state in intervention is inefficient, uh, those studies tend to get a lot more citations than those that, found, that find cases of successful state intervention. There is in fact some evidence that state institutions under favorable conditions can learn to identify promising small businesses, for example, and help them grow. I'm not at all suggesting the state should substitute the market in general. We all know central planning doesn't work. But the other extreme, in other words, to assume that states, uh, state funds to promote innovation, for example, based on rewarding certain companies, that that's always a bad idea. That isn't true either. Uh, there, are, there are studies that show that um, some of the US mechanisms, for example, that, that seek to support promising small businesses, actually are relatively good at, at selecting, within limits, that is, of course. My fifth and final point on, on economic policy thinking is has to do with investment time horizons and risk taking. There is, in fact, a very old result from the uh, economics literature from the 1950s by, by Kenneth Arrow, one of the most promise, prominent economists of the 20th century, uh, who, who shows very clearly that there's a positive welfare case for the state to fund basic research. Because basic research is too risky and too long term an investment for private investors to undertake with sufficient uh, volume. One could easily extend that reasoning to financing PhD scholars, for example, rather than charging them tuition fees. And relatedly, in the 1990s, we saw a huge boom in venture capital during the dot-com uh, boom and, and bubble. This had an odd effect on the policy beliefs of a number of people. It was tempting to forget the previous decades of slow development of the, of the internet, which would have been impossible without DARPA funding, for example, so state funding, and to just celebrate the market. On the one hand, there's no question that Europeans missed the boat with respect to venture capital. 
and still miss the boat to some degree. But venture capital addresses a relatively narrow window of opportunity. It is, <coughs> excuse me, it is when it's done by skillful investors, a relatively low risk bet. Typically, the technology is mature, the business concept is sound, the market is there, the people have the right skills. They just need a boost to scale up and tap into market size effects. But the venture capital approach is, is quite narrow. If a technology is relatively immature, then a lot more state funding is necessary. If the technology is rather more mature but quite costly, then only large corporations can afford the corporate R&D programs and facilities to move forward. Coming to my third part, so taking these points about economic policy together, we can see now perhaps more clearly what policy components would make sense, given that the US-China race we have is not simply a situation of win-win trade with nations that have no particular power ambitions and that play by the rules. It is a competition for national performance more than for corporate performance. It's partly about GDP and productivity, but it's also about military power for the future. And it is a race with antagonistic policies, with deliberate violations of intellectual property rights, with industrial espionage and with traditional espionage. So there's no doubt about how the United States sees this. And, and let me read out a, a very revealing quote from a US official. It's about two years old already, but it expresses the spirit of a sort of American awakening to this challenge. This is from Christopher Ray, who's the director of the FBI. And quote, the Chinese government is fighting a generational fight to surpass our country in economic and technological leadership. They have shown that they're willing to steal their way up the economic ladder at our expense. So that, that gives a pretty clear sense of, of how Chinese competition is, is perceived in, in Washington. So now the policy question becomes, how do states win technology races or at least stay ahead or not fall, fall back? And in short, the United States wants to, number one, get better at what it is doing at home, and number two, reduce the ability of foreign powers, China in particular, to have access to everything it is doing. So naturally splits between two dimensions. On the one hand, policy measures to boost domestic innovation systems, but on the other hand, what I would call the external dimension. So for each dimension, I'll, I'll now list a few examples of essential areas of work. So for domestic innovation systems, we're thinking about policies, policies such as uh, state subsidies for research and development, uh, supporting tertiary STEM education, uh, research universities, private venture capital, government venture capital, government procurement, innovation networks. For the external dimension, we're looking at intellectual property uh, protection as a contested space. We're looking at standards as a contested space, as was mentioned in the previous presentation. We're looking at, on the one hand, having open trade and investment with allies, but on the other hand, having restrictions to trade and investment with nations that are rivals. We're talking about measures like export controls, foreign investment screening, counterintelligence or counterespionage, espionage related sanctions, espionage vulnerability mitigation. I'll give a few examples concerning the domestic dimension. Earlier I talked about, and then that was sort of the point of my talk, deviations from classical liberal economic policy. So here's one example. Now, the example is InQtel. So InQtel was originally set up as the state venture capital arm of the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, and this is a, a an influential organization within the US debate. Um, and to illustrate this, the current chief executive uh, officer of InQtel and one of its former chief executive officers both served among the 15 commissioners of the uh, National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. Uh, just a brief word on that. That commission was set up by Congress. It was the leading US government sector effort between 2019 and 2021 to generate policy recommendations to advance US policy and interest in the field of AI. So anyway, for InQtel, with InQtel, the idea is to learn from private sector practices in the area of venture capital uh, and repurpose them for state needs and for more patient time horizons. So when they select a company, the idea is that the company should pursue product development strategies aimed at serving both civilian markets and government needs. And so the idea is that rather than have the state take over a commercial company and, and box it into uh, a future only based on government contracts, the idea is that the government body, 
meaning NQTEL, encourages the company to adopt an intermediate trajectory to be made up of um, mixed revenue streams. So partly public, partly private market. Uh, in the hope that this will generate greater returns to scale, higher efficiency, thanks to the disciplining effect from market competition on the private side. And conversely, the advantage of this approach as compared to not intervening at all is that the commercial company will, through its development, integrate current and likely future government needs because it is in dialogue with a government body which will in future want to buy its product. Uh, and so it will adjust its business development uh, strategy and it will take account of possible future government needs. So this avoids a situation where uh, the private sector develops completely detached from what state institutions might mean in the security sector or the defense sector. A second example of a sort of one of these sort of hybrid uh, US policies uh, is something called the Trusted Capital Marketplace, which was set up by the US Department of Defense. And so here the problem statement is that you have certain technology companies that are not part of the defense industry that may be developing interesting dual use products that are of potential interest to uh, to the DOD, to the defense sector. But because they're not within the close circle of the defense industry, they may have limited awareness of national security concerns. That's one problem, um, which also makes them more vulnerable targets for both illicit and illicit attempts to acquire their technologies on the part of foreign state actors. And at the same time, they need investment um, and they are liable to expose themselves to certain risks uh, in terms of how they choose who, who will invest uh, into their companies. And so the trusted capital marketplace, the idea is to filter both innovators on the one hand, investors on the other, to have some minimum degree of national security and then basically have a sort of um, a sort of safe boundary or safe space for innovators and investors to interact with each other. Having gone through something which is not quite as stringent as a formal security clearance, but nevertheless, there's a higher degree of trust. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll say it bluntly, uh, the, the idea here with this sort of thing is, is most certainly to keep out um, uh, non-trusted investors who may have uh, connections with the Chinese state or the Russian state or, or other nations that, that the United States doesn't trust. A third example, which is of more general nature, concerns the revival of discussions on industrial policy. Uh, and depending on one's background with respect to economic policy discussions, there was a time that I remember in certain policy cycles at least, where the term industrial policy was, was almost taboo, almost rude, almost vulgar, not to be mentioned in the company of polite and distinguished liberal economists. And there were reasons for that because there'd been certain policy failures in, in uh, reported in the development economics literature, for example, import substitution policies to support nascent industries and, and such policies didn't always work very well. But to be fair, industrial policy is about much more than just import substitution. It's a lot about investment, about priorities, about a degree of planning and a degree of re reliable state funding over extended periods. So there are stories of failures, also success stories, especially in East Asia, as a matter of fact. Um, and to take an example of something very much or almost completely state driven uh, in the US case, think of the Apollo program, which has led to a special expression called moonshot technology, which is sometimes used in US discussions. So the idea that you will invest in something very uncertain, very costly, not mature, uh, but with absolutely exceptional results if it if it works out. So in US discussions, there's a lot of talk that is uh, partly more oriented towards private investors trying to promote high risk long term investments. Moonshot is the riskiest. Uh, another expression is patient capital as opposed to the normal inpatient investment timelines, uh, timelines of venture capital investors. So what gets interesting is how the United States tries to combine a great diversity of of these mechanisms to have public-private partnerships, uh, in addition to relying on a, on a large federal budget. Uh, so one could say one of America's favorite activities is finding new ways of combining public sector and private sector efforts. Uh, and, and certainly the US is much more advanced in that respect than, uh, than Europeans in, in contrast. There's quite a big difference. There is another difference, which is that as a matter of fact, in spite of all the rhetoric, when the US really wants to push something forward, uh, it is capable, and when Congress is behind it, uh, of putting some quite serious money behind it, that's one thing, and also of creating new structures rapidly, 
and also to scale them up fast and to staff them fast. Uh, Americans have an understanding of the importance and benefits of scale. Expressions like scaling up or ability to scale are rather more common in US discussions than in European ones in my experience. I'm just not going to skim through a few examples of the more external. Uh, was that two minutes, Charlie? Yes, yeah, it was. It was. Uh, All right. I'm, I'm not going to wrap up and then we'll have some time for a few questions still. That would be great. All right, I'll try to hurry up. Uh, I might need a, more like four minutes, but I'll try to hurry up. Yeah. OK, so as I mentioned, a few examples, this is relatively important because it touches the antagonistic side of, of uh, the relationship. Trade and investment restrictions on rivals. Uh, you may recall last year, uh, basically bans on US financial investments into Chinese companies that are involved in either the military industrial complex of China or that are involved in surveillance technology uh, with Huawei on the list, but but also key companies from the China uh, from China's aerospace and defense sector. So it's much more than just the 5G issue. It's also shipbuilding, aerospace, mis missile technologies. Foreign investment screening is something that has uh, evolved and, and which is more stringent now in the US as well as the European Union. Another thing which has changed is uh, strengthened legislation to protect intellectual property, particularly with respect to trade secrets. Um, I won't go further into, into detail about that. Uh, and I'll skip the bit on NATO measures and I'll just come to my conclusion. So if we bring all the elements together, what we're going through really is a race focused on who gets ahead between two very large states with respect to a general purpose technology. The US approaches this in a manner that's quite different from classical liberal economics, although there is still some influence of the spirit of the 90s that can be felt, it still ling lingers on. But certainly, Things like banning external investments in certain companies in China, restricting inward investments from, from China and, and others, tightening export controls. These are all restrictive measures that go against the more liberal spirit of the 1990s. If one takes a much longer, uh, much longer term view, however, uh, some of these new measures have similarities with measures that existed during the Cold War with respect to the Soviet Union in terms of blocking technology transfers with strict export controls, for example. One thing the United States is not doing, which is perhaps the most surprising to me at least, is that it hasn't yet switched up to really large new federal budget authorizations for R&D, for basic research, uh, particularly with respect to defense. Uh, that's probably a mistake or at least an inconsistency. During the Cold War, the US devoted a substantially larger share of GDP to defense R&D. And one of the greatest success stories of US federal spending during the Cold War is probably DARPA, which is still a crown jewel. Uh, but oddly, DARPA is a little bit less central to the current hype around machine learning and deep learning, which are quite mature, and that's probably the reason. What we do see is a lot of dynamism in creating new public-private mechanisms to try to tap into rapidly moving technology that is AI to stimulate investments and also to accelerate technology adoption by the federal government and by the Department of Defense and the Armed Forces. Um, but what this all means is that really... The sort of consensus we had around economic policy roughly between 1990 and 2015, as well as a large chunk of the literature that I uh, sort of grew up with, if you like, is not fully usable. That entire body of literature, I'm talking about studies on, on the economics of innovation, for example, uh, that body of literature always tended to assume a benign international security environment. It assumed that international trade and investment were forces for good in general, without exceptions. Uh, because they ensured additional competitive forces. Uh, of course, a lot of those studies were uh, focused on OECD countries. But actually what we see emerging is more a mixed equilibrium. So economic liberalism stays among allied nations. That's good. Economic liberalism in non-strategic sectors, probably across the whole world, that's fine too. But economic liberalism in strategic sectors with rival powers, that's, on its, that's out or on its way out. This may sound very intuitive in a sense. It's also not new. It was the norm during the Cold War. And uh, it seems that we're moving partly back to that. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Edward. And uh, I, I'm glad to hear the message in a way that maybe we're moving back to something where we're 
conceptually uh, maybe more some of us com uh, comfortable with, but on the other hand, it's also a world that much of the uh, startup ecosystem hasn't necessarily lived through or, or, or experienced. So it'll be interesting to see how these worlds collide. As I put uh, into the chat, I'd like to extend our session maybe by 15 minutes or so, so that we have time for Q&A. It'll still be shorter than we had planned, um, but I think it'd be a shame to wrap things up after two such excellent presentations. Uh, we had a few questions in the chat. Um, as is usual, I will read them in case someone can't access the chat. They're aimed at Valtteri, but then I will also have another question aimed at both of you. So the two questions together. As a strategic resource, how does data differ from other more conventional strategic resources, such as energy, finance, rare earth metals, and the like? And of course, Edward, if you want to jump in, please do. Uh, and then the second question is, um, the technical standard competition seems to be accelerating, especially between the US and China. What's the practical impact of that? And what would it take for that trend to be reversed? And then what's the role of the EU in technical standard setting competition? And I might, I guess, add regulation, which seems to be the EU's forte um, in compar comparison to, to the US and China. Thoughts? Oh, there go. OK, yeah, yeah. excellent. So yeah, I, I did type up something in the chat already, but if 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 uh, you don't have access to it, um, and and I, I'll, I'll read out the answer and 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 elaborate. So the question is, you know, how is is data different from other natural resources? And and one obvious thing is that data is not a scarce resource. There's more data tomorrow than there is today. Uh, whereas you know, oil is is running out. Um, that's by the way also puts an interesting twist to the economics of data because you know money needs to transfer and when, if i give you my money or my oil i don't have it anymore but if i give you my data i still have my data so so what does that mean so it's it's very interesting but that's a whole different topic um and and the the value of of data comes from from the fact that it is not scarce, whereas the value of oil comes from that it is scarce. So, so that's that's quite interesting. It uh, data is not dependent on geography, whereas oil and and other natural resources are, of course. And and speaking of of geography, that also has a protective element to it. So you can imagine that you know if if you have um, an oil rig in the in the ocean, that that's you can argue that it that ocean also protects it. In, in, in a way, or if, if you have a forest beyond the, the mountains, the mountain range can protect it. But for data lives in the cyber environments, which, which doesn't have any natural protections around it, which is also a conceptual uh, difference. But finally, the one, one thing that I really like is that, you know, if you have a lot of oil, for example, you are very powerful um, uh, in, as in, 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 in or the conclusion is that you are very powerful. If you have a lot of data, you are very powerful, but at the same time, you have so many potential vulnerabilities at the same time. So, so when you're dependent on data, you, yes, you gain power, but you also gain uh, vulnerability. So that's, that's quite interesting. Uh, the, on, on, on the latter second question, um, the, uh, I'll start at the end and the role of the European Union in, in technical standard setting. And, and I mentioned it in my talk that European Union tends to take a regulatory approach. And I, and I did raise a uh, question that one could ponder if this is the right approach, because basically, and, and I'll give you a kindergarten example, right? Oh, where's my mic? Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to go, go blind there. Um, but uh, I'll give you a kindergarten example. If you're only, and I have little kids, so that's why my, my imagination is here. Um, but if, if you're only the kid that tells other kids what they cannot do, eventually nobody will play with you. So, so if, if your policy is only to regulate, 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 you might not be surprised at the end when people take their business elsewhere. All right, so that's something to talk about. On on the, the increasing role of, of standards, I don't see that. I mean, if, if we're dependent on technologies and the technology is evolving constantly, how could we reverse that? I, I don't see that as, as 
uh, achievable or even feasible. Um, the the Techno the standards have multiple multiple practical applications. The most recent uh, GPS uh, blocking of, of of Russian geographies uh, that hasn't been implemented yet, but could be used as a theoretical. Uh, it's not a sanction really, but but it is a, a hindrance of access to a capability. So it doesn't only give you enhancing abilities but but it also it can be used I, I i hesitate to use the word weapon you can weaponize it but you can certainly project power through the manipulation of standards and access to standard based capabilities so hopefully that was that was a, a sufficient answer i'd love to elaborate more if 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 you so wish thank you um i will have a follow-up for both of you um lots of discussions regarding a ai what the european parliament may or may not do how it thinks about it uh, but one question i'd like to address for both of you is how do you see this even discussion about potentially limiting the spheres of use of ai or is that a little bit like discussing you know where can you use electricity or not uh, and then the idea of are there things where um, there are too many risks that we have to wait quite a bit before using any sort of AI tools. So kind of high risk versus low risk environments in which to use AI. Uh, I'd like to hear both of your um, your thoughts on that. Chrissy, do you want to go first? I, it, yeah. Fundamentally, because I expect the EU, the US and China to have different listings of what are high risk and not, for example. Sure. Uh, uh, just before I jump on that, just a very, very brief uh, comment on, on standards. I mean, well, first of all, in general, standards are incredibly useful and, and the people who work on these are, are a godsend because it really helps to, uh, at some point, you have to bring the innovation to, to something standardized that, that people can adopt and so that everything is interoperable. It's an incredibly valuable uh, economic function. There is the issue of standard essential patents. And of course, when uh, when you have a rising, very large economy that becomes more and more competitive in more and more areas, as as, as China is doing, uh, at some point they may be able to have uh, to be more innovative and to have a bigger market share. And then, if if the standards are based on on their work, uh, they will benefit. They will benefit uh, from future revenue streams thanks to that. So so that's also a competition issue, not only a security issue. Um, on on high risk. Uh, yes, I mean, I mean, the, the European Commission has developed a very good uh, draft uh, artificial intelligence act. Uh, obviously, it's it's focused on protecting consumers. It's a very typically EU approach, uh, and a number of applications uh, defined it as high risk. And and uh, you know, I mean, it's this is a question of perspective of political political preference. Uh, the, the EU's approach is obviously more prudent than than probably what the US would come up with or what China would come up with. Um, and, and, and that's for civilian applications, including things like law enforcement, uh, uh, you know, biometrics and, and things of that nature, or, or, or border control applications as well, uh, which could be deemed high risk or which could pose risks to, to human rights. On the military side, there's a, there's a separate debate, uh, notably regarding uh, autonomous weapon systems. Uh, that's in the, held under UN auspices, but that was actually work I was involved in uh, regarding the NATO position on that. So the, the question is putting limits on on where you're going to apply AI. I mean, in general, AI is going to go everywhere and, and because it is incredibly useful. And, and I do want to stress, by the way, maybe my talk was a bit gloomy, but AI is a fantastic thing. I mean, to an extremely large degree, this is productivity enhancing. It can do all sorts of interesting things. So we should look to the positive mostly. Um, but yes, some regulation absolutely is is useful. There's a lot of a lot of people, both public sector and 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 civil society, working on ethical standards for AI, for responsible AI, for secure AI. That's a very vibrant area of work. So I'm actually quite optimistic. I don't know if that answers the question, but a lot of people are paying attention to making sure that AI is, is reasonably secure. A lot of people are looking at the problem. Yeah, I mean, my, my two cents on on regulation and AI um, and, and, and the word ethical AI was mentioned. 
Um, if we regulate based on our ethics and values, um, which you know typically is a is, is a good thing, and others don't, is I mean, is that a risk? Let's 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 take into account an example of military utilization of AI. If we have ethical AI utilization in, in military, and if we would happen to live next to a country where the utilization of artificial intelligence is not bound by ethics, but rather the 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 end goal of AI development is to win the war. So what does that mean for our AI development? So I mean when 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 we look at the development of these capabilities, we need to understand that these are global capabilities and there will be differences in the, in the development utilizations of them and that risk should be evaluated absolutely right. um don't see um new questions here but we've talked about in the purpose of course to look at the truly large nations nation states that are global actors um, I'm curious, so it'll be a two-part question, um, does a nation state, small one like Finland or Sweden, or, um, does it have any hope looking at this technological landscape you've, you've painted for us? Uh, does even the EU, we have kind of gotten a glimpse of your answers, um, that, that's one part. And the second one is, is there a way to compete, do you think, with uh, kind of relevant and quality of data versus very often it's about volume. But anyone who's tried to drive a Tesla in Finnish winter conditions, recognizing that it's actually downright dangerous to use any of its AI derived capabilities here uh, because it was fed different experiences, shall we say, uh, and makes mistakes that a 10 year old wouldn't make in traffic. Uh, so any thoughts? Is is there are there niches that small countries could actually use and compete here? If if if, if I'll go on, if I had the mic open there, uh, thanks thanks for that. I mean there is there is hope absolutely, uh, but it requires that we have very honest discussions about what's going on, and and we develop frameworks with which we can analyze the situation. And, I, and I'll give you an example. Um, if data is a value and currency uh, for art of, and you know for me in this discussion data and AI go hand in hand because you know they they're so intertwined but um, what is what is the unique currency of data the unique that what is the unique data that we can produce as Finland um, that gives us an edge in the global market what is our specialty in data because we should be thinking about that if we're just yet another data producer then we have no differentiation how do we differentiate in relation to data i think is a very strategic discussion to be had um and but if you find that and let's say from a military perspective that could be something intelligence related from uh forestry you know example it could be something like that um, so there is hope, but we need to understand the head start that the US and China have. It is a massive difference. We all need, I mean, we need to go back to elementary school and think about concepts of a little and a lot. <laughs> it is a staggering difference. Yeah, just, just to add to that, I mean, from from the perspective of consumers, everybody's going to enjoy the benefits of AI, and they already do. It's already all over the place and in every smartphone on the planet. So it's so the 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 downstream end user benefits that that's for the whole planet. That's fine. When it comes to having a competitive industry in your home country, obviously, exactly as Voltaire is saying, I mean, scale is is a big thing, and this is not the first time this has happened. I mean, look at the 1990s and the dot-com bubble and, and look at the contrast between the Europeans and the Americans. Uh, th this keeps on happening over and over again. Uh, I was collecting actually, uh, the, I think it's Stanford that has this really thick report with um, indicators on AI for, 
both academic and business and investment and so on. Uh, and, and private sector investment into AI companies for the United States is almost 10 times higher than in the European Union. And you really have to think, why? I mean, why is that? The European Union has almost the same GDP, a little bit smaller than the US. Uh, and the numbers are just completely off. And, and it's bizarre as well, because it's not like Europe doesn't have AI talent. There's lots of AI talents in Europe. There's lots of great university research departments. There's lots of great people who know how to code. Uh, and EU is big. There's plenty of data sets possibly that you could get your hands on, except for some barriers with GDPR sometimes. But but it's not like there's no data in Europe. But somehow the, the ability to take a nice, workable business idea and make it scale up fast and make it into a multi-million dollar uh, or ten, ten, tens of millions of dollars or more idea, that's something that Europe just keeps on failing to do. And it, it's this ability of the Americans to scale up. And in my understanding, the Chinese are also very good at that. Uh, the, uh, of course, I mean, 1.3 billion people, you'd imagine they could do that. But But the point is apparently, China manages that too, and the European Union still doesn't. So there's a lot of questions here, but it's a, it's been a problem for 30 plus years. And I don't have the answer, to be honest. I mean, it, it need, we really need to work on this. Thank you. Thank you both to Edward and to Valtteri uh, for lots of food for thought for us. Um, I think, uh, again, without further ado, no one came here to listen to me, but hopefully Edward and Walter will be open to if people have questions, emailing directly, uh, continuing conversations, um, because it's, it's, I guess, ultimately all about um, networking and uh, increasing our own little uh, data sample, as it were, and, and learning. So with that, I close this event. Thank you very much and have a good rest of the day and week.